We are here to uh, celebrate the successful assistance in community integration services pilot, uh, otherwise known as the Medicaid Supportive Housing Waiver. Um, you know, more than 30 years ago, many people, uh, public sector leaders and community leaders would argue, sometimes in this very building, about whether or not uh, homelessness was related to housing. Um, today, thankfully, while there are still some healthy debates and arguments about the realities of homelessness, it is generally understood that homelessness is driven by poverty, glaring racial inequities, and the lack of investment in affordable housing and the support that all of us need to remain permanently housed. Um, five years ago, in this building up on the second floor, um, representatives of every single hospital in Baltimore gathered together to express a shared commitment to invest in this pilot program necessary to draw down uh, federal funds. Um, we very much applaud the leadership of Mayor Brandon Scott, who recognizes the importance of affordable housing. Uh, just two weeks ago, uh, he announced the city's intent uh, after purchasing two downtown hotels to increase the supply of housing that's affordable to very vulnerable and low-income people. Um, today, we address the other side of that equation. It's generally regarded nationally that a model known as permanent supportive housing is effective in ending homelessness. Um, you have to figure out how to fund the housing, how to make it available, and you have to figure out a sustainable model for funding the supportive services that are so necessary uh, to, to help people find housing and, and keep it. 18 states now nationally have implemented tenancy waivers, allowing them to use Medicaid dollars uh, to fund some kind of housing stability. The large majority of that geared toward families and individuals exiting homelessness. Another 10 states are in various phases of negotiation and implementation. Maryland was a national leader when it applied for waiver authority first in 2017, and communities like Baltimore could participate as long as they came up with that matching support. Today, Maryland remains a leader by now in this year's budget, fully funding the state match that allows us to expand the successful pilot and ultimately to expand the program statewide. Um, our next speaker, whether she was with the Baltimore City Health Department or with Johns Hopkins or with health insurers, um, has understood that very close relationship between housing and health. Please join me in welcoming the Secretary of the Department of Health, Dr. Laura Herrera-Scott. Kevin's a lot taller, so. Good morning, everyone. Um, we were just talking before how um, we don't often get to celebrate the wins in the state, and so I'm really excited to be here to celebrate uh, one of um, a very important win that we've had in the state. Um, as was already stated, this program was started in 2017, leveraging our 1114 demonstration waiver authority. Um, we had defined criteria for who would qualify for the program, um, two or more chronic conditions, uh, high emergency department utilization, uh, frequent hospital admissions, and then, of course, whether they were homeless, marginally housed, and other things like that. And what we saw just in this pilot were significant outcomes. Now at the time, the state didn't have the dollars to match state funds, so it was really up to the local jurisdiction, jurisdictions to decide this was really important, and five counties did. And what we learned is that since 2018, 77% of participants have obtained stable housing. What we also showed was that there was an overall decline in emergency department visits as well as inpatient admissions. And in all the years that I've known Kevin and all the years that I've worked healthcare for the homeless, he has always advocated that housing is healthcare. And this pilot program demonstrated that. And now because of the Moore Miller administration and a crucial investment of 
four state general funds that will bring in 10.8 million general funds overall. We're able to expand the total number of slots we have to go statewide. And what that means is that we not only, locals no longer need to provide matching dollars, but we can now provide the wraparound services that we need to support people to remain stable in their housing. Um, this also means that we will be going from the initial 200 slots to over 900 participant spots in the state of Maryland. And right now we have 280 spots available for bid in the different counties. We will also be providing billing codes, um, technical assistance to support the providers to start billing for these services. So as the program shifts from a grant-based model to a revenue-driven model, that ensures sustainability of the program. So it's really an exciting time. It allows us to expand a program that we know um, not only puts people in stable housing, but reduces overall healthcare utilization, but more important, allows people to thrive in the community. And I would be remiss, even though we're talking about the ACES program and statewide expansion, I just also want to call out that we recognize how important housing is. And in the Behavioral Health Administration, we support housing for a different set of clinical criteria, but similar complex people, as well as in the DDA. And what we're seeing is more individual participants being their own lease owners. So they are signing the leases and staying uh, in their own housing successfully. So really honored to be here. Really excited by the work that everyone in this room has done to make this program so successful. And we're certainly really excited about the expansion of the program. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Herrera Scott. So what are wraparound services? What are the services that are otherwise not Medicaid billable that make an intervention uh, like permanent supportive housing so successful? Uh, we have a brief video. Let's turn to that now. When Baker came to the supportive housing department, he already knew where he wanted to live, and it was a place he had lived before and had a good relationship with the landlord. It went a little bit faster. Property managers, all we can do is the housing piece, but healthcare for the homeless, when they introduce their program to a property manager, we get the full picture. Since I've been working with them, I had 100% of all of them being very successful. There I was, and Mrs. Kerr started working with me. And she would say, just do everything I ask you to do, and you can get it. We know that the vast majority of people that are coming to us, if, if homelessness is the only traumatic experience that they've had, um, they're very fortunate. I wasn't going to see the doctor or nothing like that. I got high blood pressure. As long as they help me with my medication and all that, I do everything they ask me to do. Housing is health care. Our peer providers are critically important um, to the work that we do in the sense that they themselves have lived experiences with many of the things that our clients are facing. When you first start to do something, you doubt it. You doubt it, that you can't get it done. It's not going to happen for me. And that's where he was at. He was in a, in a point like, yeah, Mr. Reed, I've been trying to do this for a long time. You're trying to encourage him, look, we're going to get through this. We're going to make this happen. The day that we found a place and it finally passed inspection, he couldn't stop smiling, right? And even though he don't like to smile that much, and the thing that impressed me the most is when he got his place. He showed so much joy in having this place that he had his apartment looking immaculate. It looked it lived in. It looked at, you know, it was saying, I've been waiting to do this for a very long time. I've been housed now. I mean, as far as me having my own now, I never had it before. Look what I got.
Thank you. Mayor Brandon Scott, um, before you arrived, um, I was reflecting that 30 years ago, there used to be a lot of arguments in this very building about whether or not housing had anything to do with homelessness. Under your leadership and an evolving understanding nationally based on the data, there is no such argument. Um, Housing is the solution to homelessness, along with the supportive housing, uh, the supportive services that we all need. And let's think about that. To stay housed, I know, I know I need a lot of services, and I can either pay for them or get them from my network, my spouse, my children. Uh, we all need those services to stay housed. Uh, your leadership, um, really embodied by a press conference two weeks ago where you announced a, a very bold vision to expand the availability of affordable housing, and this morning's press conference where we're addressing the other side of that equation, how to fund in a sustainable way the support of services. Please join me in welcoming uh, Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. Thank you, uh, Kevin, and, and good morning, everyone. And we're so grateful uh, that we have evolved to understand that housing and homelessness go together and housing is the solution. And thank you all for being here to celebrate this significant milestone with us this morning. First, I'd like to acknowledge our partners in this work, Assistant Secretary for Homeless Solutions at MDDHCD, Daniel Meister, Maryland Department of Health Secretary, Laura Scott, uh, who, This is the, I have to do this every time. If you have a phone, please put it on. <laughs> Vibrate or silent, please. Don't feel bad. Normally it's the elected officials whose phones go off. Good music choice though. Uh, our, our president and CEO of uh, HABC, Janet Abrams, a healthcare for the homeless president and CEO, Kevin Lindemu, who you've heard from, and our world-renowned hospitals and health systems and their world-class teams, our University of Maryland Medical System, John Hopkins Health System, MedStar Health, LifeBridge Health, Ascension, St. Agnes, and of course, the people that keep me healthy at Mercy. Thank you very much for all being here and for your partnership. Today, we are here to acknowledge the significant contributions of our great hospital partners and celebrate the statewide expansion of Maryland's Medicaid Supportive Housing Waiver for the new fiscal year. Uh, the folks uh, represented here today have taken the Assistance and Community Integration Services Project from pilot to program in six years and helped to house 300 Baltimore households. That's 300 fewer individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness in our city. That success would not have been possible without our local hospital partners, all of our city agencies and organizations who contributed to the investment needed to launch and sustain the program over the last six years. I'm sure you heard this saying before and you'll hear it uh, from other speakers today, but housing is healthcare. Housing is one of the most basic needs uh, a human being can have, but access to stable housing brings the mental, physical, and emotional security that can have a dramatic impact on other parts uh, of one's life and health. In the last few weeks, we've talked a lot about permanent supportive housing and the supportive services that make it so beneficial. Uh, these services are tailored to the specific needs of an individual because when you're talking about supporting individuals and families, there is no cookie cutter approach. I'm glad that we have evolved well, well beyond that. It recognizes that individual need and the person who needs them as one of our neighbors and one of our fellow Baltimoreans, which is critical to help uh, destigmatize homelessness. Two weeks ago, as you heard from Kevin, we cut the ribbon on our newly acquired hotels and I'm happy to say we're currently in the process of accepting proposals from our RFP to convert them to permanent supportive housing units. And I know they will make a real difference in the lives of even more residents who are struggling with housing insecurity. We're making strides, but we all know, this group of people in particular, know that the work is far from done and will never be done until not one of our most vulnerable residents is dealing with housing security from one day, or one year, one month to the next. And we won't be able to accomplish that without the partners like those represented here today. So again, uh, from the bottom of my heart, but on behalf of all of Baltimore, thank you. 
and thank you to the community in Baltimore for believing in this program, generating the capital needed for implementation, and for being fierce advocates for the distinct support needs of our residents in Baltimore. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Scott, and thank you for that vision, not one person, not one night. Not one person, not one night. Uh, in order to apply for the Assistance in Community Integration Services waiver, uh, localities had to come on board to do so. And we're very fortunate that the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services readily agreed to apply for the waiver. Um, you, you heard from Dr. Herrera Scott from the Maryland Department of Health. Uh, you also may have read in the, in the paper over the last year about the new secretary of the Department of Housing and Community Development, Jake Day, who came into office very much saying that housing was the solution to homelessness, and it was his attention, intention, the first time I've heard this, this publicly from a housing secretary, to increase the availability of housing uh, for people experiencing, experiencing homelessness. Um, he, of course, did a very wise thing, and he promoted a woman who was actually in Baltimore City at the Office of Homeless Services helping to make the ACES pilot successful all of those many years ago, uh, who now is the Assistant Secretary for Homelessness Solutions at the Department of Housing and Community Development. Uh, please join me in welcoming Daniel Meister. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, as you probably could tell, this is a project that's really close to my heart. I had the distinct honor and privilege of launching this with all these partners in the room, wrote the application, uh, worked with all of these different entities to try and figure out how we could sustainably fund permanent supportive housing. And I just wanna share a couple of perspectives from us at the state about why this project, why now, and how does it fit into our goals around ending chronic homelessness in the state of Maryland. So it's fantastic to see how far we've come. We started with 100 slots when this program first started back in 2017. We're now at 300. We're getting ready to go through this big statewide expansion thanks to the leadership of MDH and Governor Moore. And uh, we're just really thrilled at the promise that this has. We really believe that the solution to ending chronic homelessness is more permanent supportive housing. And something that Baltimore and MDH and all the other partners in this room have done is create a new way to fund and sustainably support permanent supportive housing over the long term. This was the sole jurisdiction that designed its model to pair housing strategically with services for every single participant who joined. And that was possible through the work of Housing Authority of Baltimore City, who contributed most of the housing resources that folks are going into. And it was really made possible by the contributions of our local hospitals. Um, as a Baltimore City resident, I'm really proud of all the contributions they made because without uh, that hospital contribution, this pilot would not have happened. It took local effort uh, from each of these entities to contribute towards this initiative to make it a reality. Across the state of Maryland, we have over 4,300 people who are chronically homeless over the course of a year. And that requires a lot of sustained hard work to create housing for those individuals. Half of them live in Baltimore City. So this is incredibly important to us to see this model expand. We look to Baltimore as our North Star for how we at the state should be creating more permanent supportive housing. We are working on developing a state strategy around permanent supportive housing. And more than ever before, we're working across state agencies for housing, health, disabilities, and aging to make sure that we're braiding and coordinating across all of these systems of care. We are truly trying to be innovative. So I wanna commend our Baltimore City partners. It's so exciting to see how far you've come. We know that housing ends homelessness. We also know that housing first is not housing only. People are better off when they have access to wraparound robust services. 
they have better housing retention, and they have better health and life outcomes. So I commend all the partners in this room. We stand ready to support you to go even further, maybe to 400, 500, 600, um, and to really serve as a model for the rest of the state. We are looking to Baltimore City as our leaders on this issue. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for your leadership, Danielle. As you mentioned, uh, the ACES program provides intensive services. It does not pay for housing. It does not pay for housing. Uh, the federal government has generally said that uh, housing is housing and health is health and uh, Medicaid dollars cannot be used to pay for it. Although I will note that the most recently approved waiver um, in Arizona allows for short-term housing assistance through Medicaid. So perhaps that will begin to change. In, in Maryland, in Baltimore, uh, in order to pay for the housing, the vast majority of those slots uh, are accompanied by a voucher from the Housing Authority of Baltimore City, and we have such a fantastic leader in Janet Abrahams. Please, please come up. Good morning. I think I'm as tall as Kevin. All right, so good morning, and thank you to everyone for being here today. My name is Janet Abrahams, President and CEO of the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. I came here in 2017, and when I first got here, Danielle and Kevin baptized me into <laughs> the homeless situation here in Baltimore. And I just remember having a conversation with both of them because they needed vouchers to make this program work. And I didn't bat an eye, I didn't question, I said yes. I didn't even know how many vouchers they needed. And so I want to thank Mayor Scott and his team for inviting me to participate in this announcement and for their ongoing support to ensure the Baltimore most vulnerable population is addressed and get housing. Because without the services, the house, without the housing, the services doesn't work. We're here to recognize the impact of the Assistance in Community Integration Services Program, known as ASIC, and the impact that they have made here in Baltimore City. We commend the hospitals that have stepped up in a big way over the last five years and provided the match needed to support and to make the ASIC program such a success it has become today. I believe this will be a model across other states they recognize the dire condition under which too many of Baltimore's residents live and provided the local match needed for the city to draw down the federal funding. Because of their support and the program's success, our state, thank you, will now take over the matching contribution, allowing Baltimore to continue receiving the federal dollars that have been the foundation of this initiatives. initiative. As most of you know, the first wealth is health, and housing is completely critical to individual success. Those without housing stability are affected in many ways, with the medical decline being one of those ways. HABC's mission is to create and provide affordable housing opportunities throughout Baltimore City. And it has been an incredible collaboration with the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services to make this happen. We have provided to date 298 vouchers to this program, a commitment of $3.9 million annually. These vouchers have allowed individuals and families experiencing homelessness to flourish and take advantage of, a, of much needed services. ASICS is just one tool that we have deployed to combat homelessness. With the support of funding from the American Rescue Act, we worked with the Office of Homeless Services to identify and refer individuals and families who qualify for an emergency housing vouchers. To date, we received 285 vouchers through this initiative a commitment of $3.7 million annually from the Housing Authority. These are only two of the programs that we have implemented so far in the agencies. We have others. 
Those are the programs net $40 million on an annual basis that the housing authority is contributing to this program. We are one of many in the state of Maryland that take this opportunity to make sure that we're partnering with the hospitals, with different social service program to combat one of our most critical issues here in Baltimore City. Collectively and collaboratively, we are all doing our part to address the most important issues faced in Baltimore City. The concept, it takes a village, is most evident in our approach to combat homelessness. And I want to thank this team for remaining steadfast in endeavor. And like I tell my team every single day, we're doing the work of the Lord, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Janet. Um, as I mentioned earlier, five years ago, um, members of every single hospital in Baltimore, many of them represented here this morning, uh, gathered at City Hall to announce uh, a hospital commitment. I'm not sure that you knew quite what you were getting into um, o over multiple years, but, but they stayed committed throughout the entire pilot. Um, and, and now uh, proving the, the, the success of the program, allowing it to go statewide. Um, at the time, uh, two people spoke at that press conference on behalf of the hospitals, uh, Dr. Redonda Miller, uh, the president of the Johns Hopkins Hospital, and at the time, Dr. Mohan Suntha, uh, who now has, uh, is, is in charge of the, uh, the broader University of Maryland system. Uh, but speaking this morning, I, I'd like to first bring up Dr. Redonda Miller, followed immediately by Dr. Bert O'Malley, um, President and CEO of the University of Maryland Medical Center. Uh, Redonda Miller from Johns Hopkins. Hi, good morning everyone. It is a real treat to be able to say a few words on behalf of my colleagues, the hospital presidents here in Baltimore City. You know, this began back in 2019. Uh, the Baltimore City Hospital presidents were meeting to try to figure out how could we have an impact collectively on our local communities. And Kevin Lindemood brought an idea to us about this critical initiative, housing for patients and individuals experiencing homelessness. Immediately, all the 10 Baltimore City hospitals jumped on board because we realized that collectively we could have such a larger impact than any of us could alone, including government offices, nonprofits, and hospitals individually. We also knew that there was a proven length, as you've heard over and over, between housing and health. But none of us imagined the impact of this program would be this, uh, this impressive. Certainly when you work in healthcare, as we do at Johns Hopkins or other city hospitals or healthcare for the homeless, you see patients when they are the most vulnerable. For our patients who are experiencing homelessness, this vulnerability is compounded significantly. How can they possibly manage chronic health conditions when the simple things in life are out of reach? Things as, do you have a refrigerator to store your insulin? More complicated things, do you have a referral and a ride to get substance use disorder or behavioral health interventions? Or do you even have training for future employment? These are the wraparound services that we united to help fund because we knew they were just as important as the housing. In healthcare, we love data, love data. And so when we saw the outcome of the pilot that showed a 19% decline in need for healthcare, including hospitalizations and ED visits for individuals who were enrolled in the program, it was a wow moment. 19% decline. It's also very gratifying in healthcare to see the individuals behind each of those data points. Each of those individuals is now healthier, more secure, and on a path to wellness because of permanent supportive housing. So I will reiterate, housing is healthcare. I wanna personally thank Kevin Lindemood and Healthcare for the Homeless. Your passion and persistence truly made this a reality. I'd like to thank Mayor Brandon Scott and your whole team for providing all the support during this important pilot 
and to Secretary Herrera Scott and your team for championing it at the state level and in the legislature. Really terrific. So it is just a great example of the power of partnership when private and public entities join forces of what can be accomplished. Congratulations to all of you and thank you. And Dr. Bert O'Malley from the University of Maryland Medical Center. Thanks, Kevin. It's great to be here and to be able to say a few words. I'll start, I was talking with um, Secretary Scott as we were walking in, and you can feel it in the room, right? You can feel the passion, the excitement, the, the, the importance of this cause. And she was saying, isn't it great that we're actually in, in chaos that's going on so, so many places and so much divisiveness, divided components that we're all see, uh, face, uh, facing and being challenged by? we can come together over something that is so important and feel so good about it. So that, that in essence, um, I'm all in. Uh, I wasn't here when this started five years ago with Dr. Santa, but I couldn't be more excited to be part of this. The Medical Center is all in for its commitment as an anchor institution um, in Baltimore and as a resource for our entire state. And I'll say one thing, Redonda, Dr. Miller mentioned uh, an academic medical center and academic care. I also want to thank our colleagues across the board and the hospitals as well and partners there. But as an academic medical center, historically, has anybody heard of something called the tripartite mission? Um, in academic medicine, that, that's typically discussed as clinical care, research, and education. And growing up in academic medicine, I've been to quite a few different states in training and participation in great institutions, and everyone there had talked about the tripartite mission. At the medical center in this state, and our colleagues here, we talk about a quadripartite mission. That's clinical care, research, education, and community. And that's real. This is part of that being real. And this is unique, and this is the great thing, I think, about our institutions, our academic medical centers, and hospital partners, and this state. Um, so I couldn't be more excited about that. And interestingly, within the medical center, in our community services, we have a tripartite mission. And that is efforts to provide housing, a roof over our heads, efforts to provide food with our food assistance services team, and efforts to educate, train, and provide jobs. Tripartite mission, homes, food, employment and sustainable wages. And I am proud to say, since uh, I came here three and a half year, years ago, we've invested over $6 million in growing from the medical center, an epicenter at downtown as well, for these food assistance services programs, partnerships with our community to provide food banks, not only in our hospital, for our patients who come and provide um, uh, families, kids with food, but also connect in the community. And plus or minus, don't quote me exactly, because this is all off the top of my head, 900, although I know the number, I just did, uh, didn't have anything written for this, 900 community members partnering with the mayor's office and youth works, going out into the schools, providing education and opportunity, and then employment here or elsewhere. 900 people have received jobs as well tripartite mission. So we're all in. We're excited to be part. Thank you for this opportunity that I get to share and also feel how important this is. And homelessness, crazy, and this heat wave now, it's not just an urgency, it's an emergency. So thank you for the opportunity for me and the Medical Center to participate in this great effort. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. O'Malley. Thank you again, Dr. Miller. I see representatives of, of just every hospital system here. Uh, uh, Jill Donaldson from um, MedStar Harbor is with us. Uh, David Main from Mercy Medical Center, where apparently the mayor and I both get our health care. Uh, also, I should note that Mercy Medical Center is uh, one of the lead entities that created health care for the homeless almost 40 years ago and continues to be a very strong partner today. Uh, Dr. Miller and I were reflecting on the new faces and noting that over five, six years, uh, not only has it been important to maintain the partnership and prove the success of the pilot, but you constantly needed to bring new people into the conversation. And someone who came into that conversation and very readily recognized that the solution to homelessness was housing with the supports that people need, um, was our director of the mayor's office of homeless services, Ernestina Simmons. Um, 
please join us and, and close out this conference. Thank you for everyone's flexibility today. Good morning, good morning. As you all have heard, this is a project that took a lot of folks in order to understand the value and the meaning of what this meant for the city of Baltimore. I want to first thank the mayor for trusting me with such a large position um, in really letting me know the importance of community partnerships in order to get this work done if we're going to make homelessness rare and brief in Baltimore City. What I love about this project is, is first I want to acknowledge Michelle Owens Good has been a part of this project since the very beginning. As MOHS has had leadership shifts, she has... I think my seat wasn't even warm when she came to my office and said, you know, ASIS is extremely important and they have a meeting today and you need to make sure that you are in attendance at this meeting because they need to know that you believe in this project. But what I wanted her to know is I'd been a part of this project before people even knew. Danielle Meister made sure I understood what this was going to mean for the city of Baltimore when I had a completely different position. Um, I want to thank uh, I'm nine months into this job, but what I've learned is you surround yourself with brilliant minds and beautiful people. And HABC, Janet Abrahams have been a wonderful partner. Uh, Danielle has been a wonderful partner. And I think what makes that partnership so important to mention is because that's how this difference gets made. We get to understand what are the needs by those that have been closest to it, and we get to import important decisions without leading the most people, important people behind in that decision making. And so one of the things I'll lift up about the city is 96% of those that have come through this project have remained stably housed. And that is because we have put housing in this project. So thank you all for coming. We absolutely appreciate your attendance, um, Kevin. Lord, he's a fierce advocate. I mean, he, Kevin is a fierce advocate, and I'm grateful that you've been a part of this project. I'm grateful for healthcare for the homeless and all that you just continue to do for the city of Baltimore. So thank you, sir. And if we could have all speakers at the ready, we do have some time for any questions and answers. Come on. Got a question microphone over here for colleagues to capture sound. Senior. Mr. Mayor, this is slightly off topic yet and still on point. Uh, could I get you to speak to the incident that happened over the weekend? With yeah, uh, thank you. And thank you for the question. As I said um, uh, this weekend, uh, violence of any kind, political violence, regular violence, interpersonal violence, really has no place in uh, American democracy. Uh, we understand and know that unfortunately, violent incidents happen over and over and over and over again here in this country. And while we all are, are uh, pleased that the former president wasn't seriously harmed, someone lost their life. And I think that we have to be reminded of what now has to come from that, right? We have to look deep and have deep conversations again, because violence happens, gun violence happens in this country every single day, and no one, not even a former president, uh, can be separated from that. And that's the conversation that we have to have moving forward. How do we see uh, this uh, stop happening in our country over and over and over again from conversations that are as simple as you've heard me say many, many times before that the average American citizen should not be able to possess an AR-15. You need four months of training in the military to use one, but we let anybody just go out and buy one. Those kind of conversations I hope now after the, the tragedy from this weekend, get pushed back into the forefront and that we don't allow this to uh, turn into some simple political conversation, but about a real conversation about how this country has a problem with gun violence and not that someone who is protected by the best of the best can even be a victim of that if we do not start to take it more seriously. 
Anybody else? All right, thank you very much.